The pitmaster, a bearded giant, stood his ground. He gathered the handlers and the sleigh with the conch around him, drew his pistol and fired a shot in the air. The crowd fell, silent. He cleared his throat and growled. It was a fair fight. Don Carlos clearly won. That is the end of it. The losses, if the public takes the birds, anyone can break their necks, and it means nothing. My decision stands. Don Carlos. That might have been the end of it, but while the pitmaster spoke, a drunkard sneaked up behind him with a torch. He succeeded in setting fire to the slave's shirt. The slave smashed a drunk skull with a heavy conch and then rolled in the sand to extinguish the flames. A group of the drunk's friends snatched up more torches and advanced on the slave, shouting, Burn him! He struck a white man! And at this point, a man on a horse balcony aimed a jet of piss at the burning slave, but he could not make the distance. He spared a section of the crowd instead, including the torchbearers, who turned their attention to the wooden balcony. Someone screamed, Fire! The pitmaster disappeared under a heaving mass of bodies. They trampled the smoldering slave into the dirt. The contents of tankards and chamber pots splashed down onto the torches, followed by hoarse Turkish carpet. A coconut shattered her window. Everybody began to exchange blows indiscriminately. The losing gamblers seized opportunity to avoid paying. With most of the torches extinguished, the brawlers flayed at each other in near darkness. That is an excerpt from The Hungry Horizon, a historical fiction novel written in 2016 by Mike Hawthorne, who I'll be interviewing today. Mike is a visual artist, has grown up in West Africa, and travelled extensively throughout South America. His adventures in the tropics allowed him to garner considerable information on a group of buccaneers, led by the infamous Bartholomew Sharp, that ravaged their way down the Pacific coast in the 1680s. The book is uh, probably my favorite modern historical novel, and I'd really recommend you'd give it a read. There's a lot of moralization and modern viewpoints inserted into historical novels these days, but Mike managed to write a story which is unapologetic and brutally honest about the horrific condition of the Caribbean in the 1600s. Since the bulk of the interview will concern the book, I'll give you a quick rundown of what it's about. Our main characters are a group of turtle fishers that are forced to flee Port Royal after a massive brawl. One of them is an older Englishman named Tom, a young Catholic Irishman, a Scotsman and a gypsy. They join Bartholomew Sharp's expedition to attack Portobello, and are afterwards dragged into a series of events which they have little to no control over, and perhaps they start to regret their decision. Aside from talking about the book, we'll also be discussing Mike's experiences as an artist, and his adventures in South America. We're going to get into some pretty dark topics, just so you know. If you want to buy The Hungry Horizon, which you should, please click the Amazon link in the video description. That way I get a small cut of the proceedings. If you want to take a look at Mike's art, I'll have links to his social media in the video description as well. With all this out of the way, let's get into the interview. Why don't you start by telling us a bit about uh, who you are and uh, what you do? Well, uh, I'm 68 years old. I've been an unsuccessful commercially visual artist most of my life. But I do, I do have a kind of small cult following, if you know what I mean. <laughs> mm-hmm, of course. A few years ago... I uh, I went to and uh, I attended a course for elder people at the local university here, Roehampton, in creative writing, and really the uh, pirate stories emerged after I I got a first class degree there, so I was encouraged to try and write some novels, and uh, the pirate history historical fiction interested me so I did that for a few years and that's where my my kind of pirate writing comes from I'm curious what is it you're working on uh, at the moment uh, writing wise uh, drawing actually <laughs> uh, drawing at the moment I'm doing a kind of album it's going to be called God save us from religion and um, basically I I've got a, a copy of the Bible which I picked up in some church years ago mm-hmm. I'm tearing pages out that interests me and drawing over the text, oh, uh, uh, kind of images of what what it makes me, what it inspires me to portray from the text itself. I, I suppose a lot of my work has got an element of anger in it. <laughs> so when I see the revival of fundamentalism in religion, 
and the kind of intolerance and hatred and excuse for warfare that it brings, mm. even now, more, often more so than ever, um, on all sides, you know. But it, it, it all seems, a lot of it seems to come from this so-called Abrahamic tradition, which is the three Christianity, Islam, and uh, Judaism. Mm -hmm. So I just went back to the Christian Bible. So I've got the New Testament and the Old Testament as well to play with. And I'm going to do a series of the kind of imagery that the text actually, it, I'm quite faithful to it, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty horrifying book, the Bible. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, the whole thing is based on, uh, I mean, to me, it's become quite clear. This is simply my own personal reaction to it, that the so-called prophecies in the Old Testament are actually, the, the prophecies were written after the events. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To, to, to justify, and a lot of it's clearly made up as well. Mm. Um, so it kind of becomes propaganda for war mm. and genocide and land grabbing. And this is now a justification now, especially in Israel, for more of the same. Oh, wow. So it's all a bit uh, a bit dispiriting. But I, I instead of uh, getting involved in overt activism and demonstrations and things like that, I've been in a few in my life. I not obviously every, anybody who's on a demonstration believes that they are the the nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, the police often think, no, you're not the nice guys. You're the problem. Oh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> even when we're demonstrating against Nazis, the police attack us. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> so well, this is a bit of a hiding to nothing here. Mm. And also to get involved in arguments online with trolls. <laughs> yeah. Can absolutely ruin your day after a while. You know, you think, oh, this is too much, man. Um, especially when they're not real people, they're made in a kind of bot farm or something. Yeah. And uh, now, so instead of, you know, getting involved in activism and demonstrations and all that, I just get it out. And then eventually maybe this little book, God Save Us From Religion, will appear, you know, who knows? Mm. That might have more influence than me getting hit over the head by a policeman. Yeah, uh, de definitely. <laughs> that's that's not a very productive way to uh, get it's your opinions out. Um, yes, especially at my age, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but um, so the main bulk of the interview is, of course, going to uh, concern your writing. Uh, you've published one book, right? Yes, that was that was a bit of a fluke, really, because yeah. I, I just um, I've I've been hopeless businessman all my life. You know, mm. what I really needed at some stage was a an agent. Ah. But you need an agent to get an agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I must admit, I was lazy there. I didn't get the <laughs> right support. And so I just always did the easiest thing. And uh, I noticed that one publisher in Arizona, Fireship Press, yeah, which, which was founded by a golf champion years ago. And when he died, some female friends of his took it over. Hmm. And they, in the middle of the Arizona desert, decided to uh, make it about ships <laughs> and maritime history. So it wasn't originally about ships? Well, no, the actual, I think, Fashion Press huh. was, was the child of a golfer hmm. uh, who wrote a book about golfing, which huh. was very successful. <laughs> and then well. it, it kind of, when, when he died, in his memory, they continued the publishing. But it, it was, um, it's not, they don't do much editing or marketing. It's hmm. all down to the author. Wow. That's very interesting because, like, when I they seemed very demanding when I when I checked out their like uh, uh, yeah. requirements. So I, I well, maybe, maybe they've changed them. Um, maybe uh, since, you know because this was all back in 2016 when I mm. signed a contract with them. Right. Um, which you know, um, and I don't think it sold very well. I got you know, huh. I never made any money out of it. Mm. But at least I had the nice little product in my hand, something to shut you know. And it, they, they do, I mean, they produce a nice looking product in the end. Right. Yeah, the cover is like most, I mean, most historical fiction, most modern books, like they have just such ugly covers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I think, um, I think The Hungry Arise and it does have a nice cover, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I was, they signed me up for a trilogy. So I got, I got a bit complacent and I thought, oh, great, I've got three now. I've got a trilogy. But then they never really, I don't think for some reason they didn't like the second book. Mm. Yeah, we're unholy, um, unholy Trinity, which hasn't been published. 
Well, yeah. first, uh, first we need to know a bit more about uh, the Hungry Horizon, of course, which is yeah, yeah, the but, first book. Yeah. So, uh, why don't you tell us a bit uh, about it? Well, it was going to be obviously. Uh, it's basically can I? I've traveled in South America quite a bit, and I have good mm. friends in Chile. Basically, I've been going there since 1972, since I owned oh. this time. Um, I got being interested in history wherever I go and the culture of the countries I'm in. I tried to educate myself and I read what was available, um, basic history books about Chile. And I was surprised to come across a pirate who had burnt his way down the Pacific coast. Mm -hmm who really wasn't well known. He wasn't a household name in England. And I don't, um, but I, I noticed that he, he was mentioned in these, in these very basic history books with little illustrations. And that caught my eye. And I thought, who is this guy? And of course it's Bartholomew Sharp and he's, mm -hmm. he's a cockney from Wapping. Yeah. And, um, and he was in the original crew of Henry Morgan mm -hmm. on the Panama raid. Yeah. And he didn't come to prominence until 1680 when he launched his own enterprise. He wasn't even the chief of that lot. He was just a kind of one of three or four captains who were involved. And they decided to imitate Morgan, do another Morgan, basically. Yeah. And they, they couldn't go from Port Royal, where Morgan was kind of dying. And uh, he, was, he was a has-been by then. He was, he was bloated with jaundice and yeah. alcoholism and... And the new governor had been sent over from England and uh, frowned upon piracy. And he had to symbolically hang a few at the, at the, in the Kingston docks every so often to, to make a show of law and order to keep peace with Spain. Because the, the, the regime of Charles I and was friendly to Spain. Yeah. Charles, Charles I did not want any kind of trouble with Spain. I mean, not Charles I, his son, the Restoration, Charles II. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And of course, a key figure in all this is the figure of the King of Spain at the time, who was a total <laughs> invalid, a total invalid, a grotesque invalid. <laughs> but funnily enough, he outlived all the other monarchs. Yeah, and, yeah, he did. When he finally died, that's when the buccaneers came to an end and piracy began. Mm, yeah. Um, after, because there was a huge war in it was called queen anne's war in america yeah uh but it was the war of the spanish succession because this guy was such an invalid i mean there was no way in he could reproduce yeah no way no oh. but sharp sharp just interested me so i began to dig around over the years i accumulated a bit more information about him yeah uh in the and finally when i went to university i i got into the library at greenwich maritime museum and I found various copies. One book supposedly written by Sharp himself, yeah. which, I, which I think was just an adaptation of Ring Rose's narrative. Mm. I mean, Sharp was also extraordinary because he had almost a press corps on board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had various writers who, because it became, it became a way of making money in England to sell pirate stories. I mean, Daniel Defoe probably wrote the big, the, the big book about all the pirate captains of the time of his time mm -hmm. um, and these guys were basically cashing in on on the fascination of the british public with highwaymen pirates any kind of outrageous criminals yeah yeah i remember of course in in the book you have a sharp explaining that um... Uh, this is the new way to make money by having all these uh, nerds writing books books for me yeah 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 well um, it's it's another way to, and it's also something documented. You see, when you went to court, and he did go to court in London, he, yeah. was, he was accused. He could produce all this writing, yeah. and that was rare. I mean, if you were just a, if you were just a semi-literate ruffian, you, and also I think he he had some political influence in London. A dark shadow keeps cropping up in the background of a lot of the buccaneer stories. A guy called the Duke of Sunderland who was a political player, very important. Um, I think he was a kind of Whig. He was, he was anti-Catholic. And uh, although I don't, think, I don't think Sharp cared which religion you were, I think that was more, there was a guy called Watling who had a leather mutiny against Sharp. He was oh, yeah. definitely a sort of roundhead, old Cromwellian, oh, pure, okay. a bit more fanatically anti-Catholic. Mm. Whereas Sharp, Sharp was an opportunist and yeah. 
a very good navigator, but also yeah. a realist uh, to the point he was such a pragmatist that the other captains accused him of cowardice all yeah. the time. Yeah, and all the uh, all the writers as well, like Lionel and Dampier, you know, they called him a coward as well. He wasn't. I mean, the reason they did that was because basically he was reluctant to attack yeah. fortresses on land, and he was right because you could have a much more profitable and long existence simply at taking out ships because the pirate ships were overmanned. They had many more guns and men on board, so they could take virtually any ship they fancied. Yeah. Um, but the the terrible irony was this didn't get into any of my books, but they once captured a, a ship full of crude silver, which the Spanish. Oh were no, you, you don't. You excluded that from the book it, because it's in a it's it was going to be in a, in the final chapter, mm. the final book. It was going to be a trilogy, and I mm. only wrote the first two. Oh only, yeah, okay, okay. Um, only the first one got published. Mm, I'm of thinking course, yes. of, of trying to uh, printing out the the second one for the hell of it. Just yeah. you know, um, to have it as a product, and also because I think it's a better book than the first one, the Unholy Trinity. It's even got a better title. Well, have you um, have you finished the draft? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got it ready. You know. Okay. I I I, I, I edited for the last time last month mm. um, because I sent it to a professional editing service, and they no. they left a lot of um, red lines and marks and squiggles. Mm. And if you want to self-publish, you send that to a printing press, and they say we can't, we can't correct all this. So yeah. basically, I go through the whole thing from beginning to end. Oh yeah, That's, you know, hundreds and thousands of words. Yeah. Um, and now I finally got it, and I corrected a few, uh, few mistakes which I noticed, uh, grammatical errors and things like that. So now it's ready. That's good. But do you do you, do you include the? Um... Uh, the bit about the silver, or is that going to be? In oh the no, third no, book? no, 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 no! Because the thing was, I thought, oh, I'll just write this book about Charles' voyage, mm. and then I then I realized how enormous the subject was. Yeah, I, mean, I had no idea. I thought, I thought this was just going to be a sort of a pirate raid, end of story. You know, no, no, no. <laughs> this thing, this thing, when you get into it, it's fascinating because, yeah. it, I mean, the first, the first. The Hungry Horizon. I got a bit stuck with what was going on in Jamaica, mm -hmm. like because a lot of pirate stories they don't mention slavery very much. Oh no, no, no. So I thought this needs to be corrected. We need yeah. to have a chapter on a plantation, yeah, and um, we need to see how the slaves were treated and what the attitudes were towards them, you know, mm. um, and so on, and then the living with the Kuna Indians. Yeah. That, that's never really been explored very much in fiction either. No. So I thought, right, we'll give them a couple of chapters in the Kuna village and on the warpath, you know, and all this yeah. sort of thing. So before I knew what was happening, I had a huge book and I'd only got one third of the way through the story. <laughs> yeah. And then, then I thought, oh God, this is going to be, now it's going to be book two, which is the raid on Peru and Chile. Yeah. Which was what first got my interest. Yeah. Yeah. Because I actually went to La Serena and saw the plaque on the mm. cathedral wall where they'd, uh, where they'd uh, burnt the old wooden cathedral and now yeah. the new one built and all that. Um, and the way that he'd even got into Chilean language and folklore a bit, you know. Mm. And uh, the local football team wears skulls on their sleeves mm. in honor of him. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and so, in fact, if you look at my Zoom meeting thing, that is the uh, that is the chest badge on the football team of Coquimbo, which is in oh. Chile. Okay. So it's is that a, uh, is that supposed to be Sharp himself? Um, well, it's, it's a generic pirate. I don't <laughs> believe. You know, I don't think he had an eye patch. I mean, no. there are no portraits of him. And yeah. No, we don't even know if he was blonde, brown haired. We don't know any. Yeah, you uh, you depict him as um, as being blonde, light haired. Uh, no, blonde weasel, a weasel yeah. kind, of long, tall weasel. That's just the way. Maybe it comes from an illustration I saw of him in a Ch Chilean kids book. Mm. You know, he looked like a sort of skinny, not very healthy blonde guy. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how it all evolved. Um, I even wrote a screenplay about the the, oh. the trial of Sharp in London. Oh, okay. But these, the, I mean, 
he, he, I think in his youth, he would have been what they called a Thames mudlark. Mm -hmm. These were, these were, after the fire of London and the plague and all that, there were a lot of half orphaned, feral children. <laughs> Yeah, wandering around everywhere in the burnt out ruins, you know, and on the banks of the Thames. And many of them would have been a glorified rent boys, you know, sort of yeah. give you a blow job uh, for, for <laughs> a penny. Just to, uh, and that they would have been, they would have had little gang leaders, you know. Yeah. And he, that's where he may, might have got his leading groups of yeah. criminal. I mean, he did have relatives in Stepney. Mm. Uh, but not, not much is known about them. So he's basically an East End Cockney and yep. com coming from the lower ranks of society. Ringrose is a bit different. Ringrose was um, trained by the clergy. Hmm. He, he was like a, a cleric. Yeah. That's how he became literate. But he wasn't a softy at all. I mean, he was quite, no. quite willing to go out and fight duels with the other pirates. Oh, and, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... I try to get a little bit under the skin of the, the characters. And of course, I'm heavily fictionalizing. Hmm. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, something I, that's something I always wondered about in the book, which, um, which parts of it uh, were real and which parts weren't. Um, when, you're, when you're introducing fictional elements into a historical novel, I think you, even if you don't intend to, you are actually going into your own experience of life in order to hmm. make it feel more real. Oh, yeah, of course. So especially with the character of Captain Cook, who, who um, Edmund Cook, right? Edmund Cook, who was in fact deposed at one stage uh, because it uh, became yeah. a little bit too much the way he was buggering his. his <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this reminded me very much of a. I went to a boarding school in England, and this this oh. reminded me very much of an old naval captain who used to be a brutal paedophile. Oh shit! And so. When I go, when I paint this portrait of Cook, that's who I'm thinking of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you really uh, really portrayed Cook as uh, an oh, unpleasant no, fellow. Well, this is another good way of releasing anger. You see, you you, <laughs> you you think you're writing about a pirate captain, but in fact you're writing about an old naval commander who became who became a kind of terror figure to mm. little boys in a preparatory school, boarding school, you know. Mm. So, um, yeah, I didn't have to look very far to find my inspiration there. <laughs> no, no, I th and that, that's something I really liked about the book, because, of course, like you mentioned before, like most pirate fiction chooses to uh, ignore slavery or just remain ignorant of it. Whereas, well, uh, or mention it as little as possible. Yeah, of course. But yeah. um, in The Hungry Horizon, of course, you're very sort of uh, a, a very raw depiction of the actual history, you know. First thing that would have struck you. If when you went to Port Royal, mm. would have been the slave trade and what was going on in the plantations because the sugar thing was just kicking off. It had just yeah. it, it had just come from Barbados. They'd taken the island from the Spaniards and they wanted to make another Barbados in Jamaica. Yeah, with all the horrible brutality that went with it. Yeah, and was taken for granted in those days. Yeah, but, you know, really until much later in the 17th century when the but that's that's a completely different century and going far yeah. ahead from where we are. We're, we're just at the beginning when when people were basically coming up from society, looking to make their fortunes by any means necessary. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I like that there weren't like any characters that because that's often even in books where you see uh, and uh, where you see slavery, it's often like the main character or something is supposed to be uh, a sort of paragon where they're kind of. Oh, I'm I'm against yeah. slavery and I'm against all this. Uh, I mean, none of your characters really are that. I mean, Tom is sort of like he he's basically a kind guy. Yeah. Um. So he would have been he would have been upset by any kind of brutality, mm -hmm. but he doesn't come out with a kind of manifesto or anything. He's not. Yeah. He's he he just thinks, oh, that's a bit much, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, he wants to he wants to buy the uh, the black uh, washerwoman as his uh, yeah. as his yeah. wife, you know. <laughs> which which many of them would have done. Yeah, of course. Uh, and also, I mean, they do get Port Royal was was full of brothels. Yeah. And often these people, the the actual women, would have been kidnapped in London. And just, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's a gypsy there who gets kidnapped, a woman, and because gypsies were regarded as enslavable, hmm. Egyptian, you see, heathens. So under British law, oh, they're, they're not really Christians. You can enslave them. So you could catch a gypsy on Putney Common, 
take him down to the riverside and sell him to a slave captain. Mm. And no questions asked. In Scotland, it was a crime to be a gypsy, <laughs> to be hanged for simply being one. Have they uh, have they removed that law since then? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, uh, since not uh, everyone has read the book, um, do you want to introduce uh, introduce us to uh, uh, the main characters in the book? So aside from Sharp and the historical figures, yeah. Basically, it's it's a, a version of the Three Musketeers, the three mm. of them. Uh, and also it's an Englishman, a Scotsman, and an Irishman, which is yeah. how, how you start a lot of jokes in England. And it's how you start a lot of wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I thought, who we got? We got the main character, who is kind of my mouthpiece. And yeah, I had Sharp and all his people, and they were vague. You know, they, they, they were vague historically. I couldn't inhabit them properly. Mm. But I could, I could invent some people who could witness them and interact with them. Was there any of them that you... Uh, was, so Tom is your favorite, then? Well, he was my, he's a kind of a bit me, you know, an oh. old kid. Old kid you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, be, he seems like... Yeah. To, wish he, to wish he was somewhere else. Less, oh, yeah. Less uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, uh, wants to go to the... Um, I, I remember. I remember when he talks about uh, his uh, dream of going to the Netherlands and eating sausage in the in the evenings and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and having a nice fat <laughs> Dutch prostitute and a nice Ida down. <laughs> that's what that's what he wants. That's his idea of heaven. He doesn't want all this killing and sailing and murdering. You know. <laughs> well, did did you have any personal or life experiences uh, other than the boarding school that uh, shaped the events or the characters in the book? Uh, yeah, yeah, probably because I I mean, the boarding school was 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 <laughs> permanent feature of, for about twelve years. Um, but in the holidays, I used to go wherever my father was working, and he was in the early days. He was working on the West African coast. Mm, yeah. So I used to live in places like Lagos, Freetown, mm, and the Congo, yeah. Kinshasa, and all these were big slave trading areas originally. And you could imagine just sitting on the beach, what would have gone on there a few, a few, you know, about a hundred years before. Yeah. Uh, and it. It all seemed very kind of close. I could see how these disease-ridden white men would try to get a little bit of money out of anything they could. On the and then many of them would leave their bones there, of course, because it was known as the white man's grave. Even when we were there, we had to be vaccinated from top to bottom and take loads of pills every day to avoid malaria. But in a way, it was a very privileged existence as a child who had no responsibilities to be allowed to witness that part of Africa. And I'm so happy that he chose that part and not the part like the Rhodesia South African part, yeah. which was white, white controlled yeah. completely. I mean, th th these, these, these was independent black countries. Yeah. They were still controlled by multinational um, economics. And that's why my father <laughs> was there. But it, was, it wasn't in your face apartheid. You know, it wasn't the sort of thing that I don't know what I would have done if I'd witnessed apartheid firsthand. I don't know. I, would, <laughs> I you know, dread to think. <laughs> <laughs> and these were these were places run by local politicians, and they still had their network of old kings and princes and mm. a bit of juju magic and all <laughs> that. You know, so it kind of gave me a bridge to um, what would have happened on the other side of the Atlantic, maybe. You know, once they once they'd. Uh, they'd ended up in those awful plantations. Mm. No, I, um, I was very impressed in the book that you, um, that, that you really went into the, uh, how the different tribes were treated and stuff. Like you talked about those that they were called like the sheep or something that had their ears cut off. The Portuguese had a habit of um, marking them on the ears like sheep. Yeah. I, I mean, they were branded as well, but yeah. they were literally treated just like tame animals. Yeah. So you would have made your mark wherever you thought, and the, 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 this captain just thought, "Oh, I'd just clip their ears like like they were my sheep," you know. Yeah. In Jamaica, it was a particularly brutal existence. You know, it took yeah. its cue from Barbados, which was a sort of slaughterhouse. They were yeah. forced labor concentration camp, kind of, hmm. um, and they didn't bother with uh, maintaining the population of black people to a decent standard because they they could rely on a fresh ship arriving so they work people to death and mm. then the next lot please you know yeah 
So ghastly, yeah, yeah. And the pirates, there's a lot of mythology about once a black man stepped on a pirate ship, he was equal to the other. <laughs> and it, that's nonsense. As a, as a, on the whole, the pirates would have just sold the men on. They would, yeah. have, sold, they would have sold the slaves on to whoever without to, uh, cheap too. And they would have done the same to Indians, to Red Indians, Native Americans. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing changed completely with the War of Spanish Succession. Uh, when when you get the, the sort of fetishism of the gull and crossbones and all the, the eye patch and the all that stuff that all comes in after the uh, after the war of Spanish succession yeah. yeah and these pirates they lasted maybe two three years whereas sharp was there for 20 30 years you oh know, yeah he was, yeah the old buccaneers they lived longer generally if they were successful yeah whereas a pirate he was lucky if he got away with it <laughs> for more than six weeks, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. But I, I got the I got curious about it earlier when you first told me about the art. Um, is is there any sort of element of uh, anger in your writing? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I I am aware of a thing called violence pornography. Okay. Which a lot of people who write obsessively about war and death and mutilation and the reader gets a kick out of it because he's sitting in a in the safety of his armchair mm. and that worries me a little bit sometimes that maybe my anger you know I'm, I'm letting that it's a bit like gratuitous violence in a film you know what I mean sometimes yeah. you need violence in order to get the conflict going make the story interesting mm. why don't you just do it for its own sake I mean, there's a whole branch of films which purely about the violence and the story doesn't matter at all mm. Yeah. So it's it's a kind of one one has to be aware of one's own dark side when one writes about these things. Yeah, of course. Um and um, they, you know everybody's got a dark side. Yeah, definitely. Uh have you ever read the book uh, Blood Meridian? Yeah, I I tried, but um <laughs> I got through about two chapters and I found it quite interesting, some very good writing in there. But uh I got sick of it after about two chapters. <laughs> you know, this uh, is just going on and on and on. And maybe people feel the same about my book, because the thing is, when you're writing historical fiction, I stuck close to the plot of the uh, actual events because they fascinated me. But that isn't the way to write historical fiction. So that's probably why it didn't sell very well. I mean, basically, the real experience is long periods of boredom, bickering, oh, yeah. and then another battle, and then you repeat and repeat and repeat, you know? Right. So... It isn't like, oh, here we have a beautiful... So I tried to make Thomas, the main character, have this yearning not to be there. But even that got a bit sickening after a while because he's, keeping, he's always moaning that he doesn't want to be there. Yeah. So eventually, uh, uh, in the Unholy Trinity, he has a kind of epiphany where he where he's um, escaped with his life and he's sitting and he watches uh, a huge shoal of whales go past for the first oh. time in his life. He sees them. They come very close. And then he kind of gets a broader view of life, and you think, I think I'll just be like these whales, you know, I'll go with the flow, take like, and stop mm. always wanting to get back to this imaginary heaven in the Ida down with the fat Dutch woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the whales remind him of uh, of the woman. <laughs> no, they're actually uh, a little bit like they they remind him of God, a little mm. bit like you know Moby Dick kind of. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's cool. That, that's a good book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good because there's so much open-ended. Uh, symbolism in it oh yeah it, it it keeps you it makes you think and you see parallels and hmm. Um, hmm. did you get the chance to visit any or all of the locations in the book some i've never been to jamaica although hmm. i love reggae i mean if you look at my artwork my yeah. Instagram page hawthorne.mike a lot of it especially the earliest stuff was to do with reggae oh yeah yeah and jamaican stuff although i've never been to jamaica itself it always struck me as a kind of dangerous place Hmm. where lots of you know, pirates well i think i got put off when when it erupted into violence because at one stage the cia flooded the island with cocaine hmm. and you even felt ripples of that in london on oh. the in the clubs people shooting on the dance floor and stabbings and in the 70s and eight and early 80s it began to change in the 80s it changed drastically hmm. uh after the brixton riots and all that and I was getting older as well, and I, you know, 
I thought, this is really something for a very brave young man to go and explore piracy in Jamaica, you know, especially yeah. somebody <laughs> with limited funds who couldn't afford the kind of protection you might you might enjoy if you were richer. Mm. And nowadays, I mean, uh, some Jamaicans go back there having made a bit of money here and they go back and they buy themselves a nice property in Jamaica and the locals kill them. Oh. And local robbers will come and kill them. You know, their dream will end in bloodshed on the terrace with mm. machetes. Wow. So it, well, that comes from poverty and drug addiction and everything, yeah. Mm. And that's where I identify the decline in the quality of reggae music as well, which came in really when, as soon as it went digital, I, I lost interest. It's got to be live for me. You know, it's got to be real instruments. And that's a, that's a real shame to hear about Jamaica because uh, I've always been very interested in uh, in going there. But uh... I'm sure I'm sure if you go to an all-inclusive eh. resort. That, that's, the, that's the thing though. What, uh... you, you'll be perfectly safe. <laughs> yeah, because that's the, that's the thing though why I don't really like traveling because you know i i really want to yeah. i mean either you either oh yeah i've had i've had some hairy adventures for instance in cartagena in in colombia mm. i was there with my my girlfriend and uh, we stayed on a bus a bit too long okay. and we ended up in a little village off the beaten track where we were definitely in big danger and uh, we had to think quite hard about how to get out of there alive oh damn And that was on a beach with the Caribbean Sea in front of you. So I said, okay, now what you do is without drawing too much attention to yourself, we're being followed by three guys, yeah, mm. young guys. When you see something like a big stone, which you can throw easily, pick it up. And I saw a big piece of lead pipe just lying there. And I just picked that up. And I said, just, and, and I sort of, I didn't sort of wave it at them or anything, but I just made sure they knew that if they came for us, there would be opposition. Mm. It was a bit of a bluff because they could have had us probably. Yeah. You know, three fit young men against not so young couple. Mm. But at least one of them would have ended up with a broken skull. Yeah. Or maybe they thought twice and gradually we managed to lose them. And uh, we actually took refuge in the nearest all inclusive hotel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that's what you do when, you, when you, you take your mind off where you're traveling. Like we were in a bus. And the, the, they had a thing called a spar, a spari in Colombia, who is a young guy who's, who stands on the platform of the bus. And he kind of advertises and shouts for customers to come and all this. And it was clear to me that this guy was off his head on cocaine. He was buzzing like a chainsaw. <laughs> and he had a thing with the driver as well. They had some sort of communication going on, you know. Okay. And if I'd been alert enough, I would have spotted that we were the only obvious tourists on the bus yeah so when we were finally dumped for instance i asked him to let us off at a specific beach he didn't he didn't mention it so when we thought we were getting off at a beach we were in fact getting off in this little village of desperados <laughs> <laughs> so this was quite a piratical experience so i've had a couple of experiences like that in bahia in brazil mm -hmm. oh yeah <laughs> the little kids are trained to run up behind women and pull the earrings out of their ears before the woman can react Mm. Wow. that kind of thing and then if you go down the wrong alley the atmosphere oh, yeah. suddenly changes and you see a group of guys and there's just something that tells you don't go any further turn around you know yeah yeah but places like bahia cartagena and, it, and a lot of these guys are angry because there is quite a lot of racism in south america and the colombian government especially doesn't really supply the little islands in the Caribbean with enough water or, or public works or anything. So they they come on, they save a few pennies and come on a boat, canoe, whatever, and they go onto the beach and they want to be massage people. They want to be sell you sunglasses. They want to, and they're very aggressive and they want to sell you oysters. And they'll come up to you with a knife and an oyster. <laughs> and then you open your mouth to say, no, thank you. They'll put the oyster in your mouth. <laughs> so you've already eaten it you already owe them something <laughs> wow but they're coming from desperate poverty you know they're, they're yeah. coming from islands which don't have fresh water hmm. so even getting a bottle of drinkable water is a big deal sometimes yeah wow and so yeah and uh similar experiences in Ilo in peru which actually features in oh yeah yeah, in, uh, yeah it's uh where they destroy the sugar work yeah There's a, there's a beach called Playa de los Ingleses. A lot mm. of town, 
the English beach. A lot of little seaside towns in South America have the English beach, which <laughs> usually means that's where the pirates landed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been to a few of those famous beaches, and uh, right. quite often one had to be alert, and, uh, and immediately you stop being streetwise, you can easily drift into trouble. Mm. Same thing can happen in Barcelona. <laughs> right. If you get drunk and you know, some dodgy character in a bar wants to take you home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, suddenly you're in a bed with uh, Edmund Cook. <laughs> yeah, or worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. With Ed Edmund Cook and his two brothers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what, what I was thinking mostly is like um, uh, my mom was, uh, was in Gambia when she was a photographer. And yeah. Uh, she she experienced this like she was um, sort of treated like uh, like an elite almost, whilst mm. uh, she wanted more to sort of get the um, you know the sort of raw experience just to sort of be uh, be like one of the Gambians, which I mean of course it's impossible because she's uh, you know she's white as shock you know where. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can fully understand. Yeah, yeah. So it's um it's sort of like always that's always why I'm reluctant to travel uh, very far abroad because you know I kind of want to get the. When I was in Egypt uh, as a kid, uh, we always mm -hmm. traveled to these very sort of rural areas to really get a view of like yeah, uh, yeah. how the ordinary people lived instead of, you know, the big hotels and stuff. But yeah. uh, that's uh, it's hard to do because everyone wants to sell you stuff or uh, well, treat you. Yeah, here, I mean, there's a, there's a rather disparaging way of calling that. It's uh, here it used to be called slumming when rich people from the West End of London, especially young men, Mm. used to go to the East End a hundred years ago, you know, Victorian gentlemen, mm -hmm. and simply to observe the, uh, the terrible poverty and the drunkenness and the prostitution and stuff like that as a kind of adventure. And it was called slumming. It was a well-known feature of London life. Mm. And, of course, one or two of these guys never came back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I feel a bit similar about what you might call poverty tourism, you know, you think uh, you'll be shocked and you yeah. might. I, I think that the secret is to have friends in that country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who know the ropes and then you won't make any of the obvious mistakes. Yeah. Uh, simply to go as a complete outsider, you might as well be coming to a different planet. Yeah. You know, here, here comes a Martian. What are they going to do? Yeah. <laughs> make, you know? Yeah. And then in Chile, Chile has its own problems, of course, um, but uh, occasionally on the beaches where Sharp went and in places, my main worry was packs of wild dogs. Oh. Because coming from Africa, it, I have it, when I see a pack of wild dogs in Africa, they were often rabid. Mm. You could see that in the heat of the day, foam coming out of their mouths. Oh. So I've had, I've had a kind of thing about when I see more than three or four dogs following me around. <laughs> Oh wow! And in, in Chile, they're very sentimental about dogs. They, they, you know, I mean, you probably get less stigma if you kill a human than if you <laughs> if you're cruel to a dog in Chile. Oh, wow. So, so they they tolerate half-starved mutts, sort of yellowish, scrawny, sharp teeth, wandering around the beaches all the time. So that took a bit of getting used to. Mm. Uh, apart from that, you'd find a sperm whale, complete sperm whale, lying on the beach in front of you. Oh, yeah. And the, the local kids would have come with knives and cut graffiti into it. Huh. Well, <laughs> are you, uh, you going to include uh, uh, the bit about the ring rose rights uh, he briefly mentions? I think it's near uh, Arica. He mentions yeah. a house built from uh, whale bones. That did it. That, that somebody saw a chapel. It was a chapel. They built it out of the rib cage of a whale, and yeah. they put a kind of crossbones on top of it for the cross. Yeah, um, these things did exist because uh, that's a very, very desert area. There's, there's nothing there, you know, mm. um, and uh, the, they would have used anything. Built a cabin out of whale bones would have been, you know, yeah. Mm. We there's no wood. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, the the town of Iquique around there, that that which is now a big town due to mining in those days it was a little island with half starved people living on it and mm. fishing yeah that was yeah um and i also my main sort of big where i really got a sense of the pirate was when i went to juan fernandez 
they call it Isla Robinson Crusoe now. Oh, yeah. it, used, <laughs> it, used, it used to be called Masa Tierra, nearer the land. And then mm-hmm. the other one, that small one, which is now called Selkirk, was called um, Masa Fuera, further out. Mm-hmm. And I spent a couple of weeks there, and I must say it was very exciting. And they even had a, a little group of people there who wanted to do away with Father Christmas and replace him with Father Pirate, <laughs> you know, officially. So that Christmas would be when the pirate comes with a treasure chest and gives <laughs> presents to the kids instead of the three kings. <laughs> so I mean that that's pretty pretty relevant because um, I mean in one of the in one of the chapters, um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. since the since the Spanish were forbidden to trade with each other's colonies, you know, sometimes pirates yeah. were the only way for them to uh, you know trade with each other. Yeah, yeah, but um, actually living for a while on Juan Fernandez. I was actually living in a place called Pirate's Refuge. It was a little bed, one of the very few bed and breakfast places there. And they had a kind of pirate flag flying. And I thought, God, I've, you know, I've come home. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the people were riding around on horses with knives in their belts. <laughs> uh, of course, most of them have to make their living catching lobsters. That's oh. the main industry. That's the the one big thing that comes from is shellfish. Mm. Well, that's nice. Yeah, so you get far too many lobsters. A lobster every day, breakfast, <laughs> lunch, and a lobster, you know. No thanks. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to throw a curveball here and go right back to the Hungry Horizon. Uh, okay. how, did you, how did you conduct your research for it? Um, mainly in the Greenwich Maritime Museum. Mm. The most expensive bit of research, apart from traveling to these beaches, that I did was was an atlas which was produced in in California, I believe, which was Ring Rose's original Buccaneers atlas, and it had the whole story in there, Ooh. along with maps which he drew as he was constantly making maps. Yeah, and some of these maps actually helped to save him and uh, Sharp's life when they got back to London because they were then given as a present to the King Charles. Yeah. And uh, they were beautifully, you know, he had them specially redone in London by a cartographer. And it was difficult for Charles to execute this man who had just, it was a bit like Snowden's secrets, you know, hmm. it was WikiLeaks, <laughs> you know. It was, yeah, I mean, no one, uh, the, only the Spanish knew about what, what was in the Pacific yeah, Ocean. It, it was their own private secret ocean. And this, these maps had um, depths, so you could know, know where to anchor your ships. Of course, it never came to that. But if it had come to a naval war in the Pacific between Spain and England, these maps would have been absolute gold yeah. dust. And Charles knew this. Maybe he could have used them as well in, in dealings with Spanish diplomats. He said, yeah, well, what you don't know is that we know all about <laughs> secret gold harbors and what have you. Yeah. I also discovered some diaries in Peru Okay. Of the period, how they live, the kind of stuff that used to go on in the monasteries. I mean, the Franciscans and the, I forget, the Dominicans, I think they had a little war going on. Mm. So you get monks stabbing each other in the streets. Well done. <laughs> that, that sounds like a very colonial Spanish thing to do. Yeah. Uh, on top of everything else, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we so, got we got pirates coming to kill us, but hey, let's stab you over there. This like different sect of Catholicism. I think the Franciscans were regarded as troublemakers because they were they tended to be kind to the Indians. Hmm. Oh no, we can't allow that. And Jesuits. Oh, the Jesuits had a lot of foundations, and the Jesuits had a sort of double role. Sometimes they protected the Indians, and sometimes they acted more like colonial masters. You know, with their own plantations, vineyards, and what have you, brutal regimes. Mm. On the raid on Santa Maria is the, um, I forgot his name, but the, uh, I think he was a mestizo commander. Uh, is he fictional or is he like, is there some sort of historical background to him? There was a priest there and there was a church. Yeah. And I believe it was a Jesuit church. I invented his name as a typical Habsburg Austrian name because oh, yeah. the, the Austrians, sent a lot of Jesuits to be trained in Rome and they, mm. the more fanatical ones would have wanted to go out and convert the Red Indians, you know? Mm. And uh, the, the story of one of them being fed to a crocodile is true. I mean, the guy was saying, oh, St. Francis, our great um, people like that, they could talk to the animals and God loved them and he would not. So, okay, let's test it. So they picked him up and threw him into in, <laughs> in where the crocodiles were and of course he, he died. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so, you know, it was like a practical demonstration. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, of course, the 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 Kuna witch doctors. Oh yeah. They they're called Leres, and apparently they still have influence to this day. Okay. They would they they would have been like the secret rulers of everything, and they mm. they they could predict the weather and they could do this yeah. and that. They knew exactly when the white men were coming and <laughs> and um, they would have had a kind of war against Catholicism going on quietly the whole time because that directly threatened their power. Mm. And the Kuna were interesting because I think they had a war against the Panamanian government in 1925. Okay. And um, one of their symbols was a swastika. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, and to this day, they have a certain amount of autonomy in their area because of mm. that. You know, they, they they won't let cars, they won't they won't, they won't let too much polluting technology. That's mm. the theory, anyway. That's one place I never visited, which I regret is is the Kunayala, mm. um, mainly because my partner is a little bit fussy about where she where she sleeps. You know, she, and these these were bamboo huts on stilts above the river you know yeah so we thought hey, maybe this is a i mean if i'd been on my own i would have done it but um, <laughs> i i think you know and then you you don't have a proper toilet you just you know you just uh, go between the bits of bamboo um so quite apart from mosquitoes oh yeah uh we thought maybe we'd give the, the kuna yala a miss mm. but those are the famous sun bless islands which were I mean, the two tribes that supported the pirates were the Mosquito Pirates. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, the Kuna. How did so you the, How did you conduct your research into those tribes? Well, I read a lot about them and even bought books about their mythology and oh, yeah. history and all that. But mm. I didn't go too deeply into it. I just made. I, made I think I think one, you did uh, way more than Tom I know. At least friend, Tom had a friend from his previous raid who is based on a real character, historical character called yeah, Captain uh, Andreas. And he was a real character. Yeah. And uh, he had an unfortunate death in the end because I think he was either pushed down some stairs or he fell drunk down some stairs oh. on, an English, on an English ship many years later. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was pretty old, right? Like, I think Sharp wrote he, that he was he like... Old, but, but I think this might have been around the time when Scotland tried to establish a colony in Dalian, which had huh. fatal results. Yeah. All yeah, the yeah. Time. No, I uh, I've only read uh, Lionel's book, um, yeah. so it's like uh, I learned a lot in the about the Bakuna. Um, yeah. Well, he became one almost. Yeah. In the end, in fact, when he was rediscovered, he was mistaken for a Kuna. Oh yeah. Because he looked like one. Yeah, the Dampier wrote that he uh, had trouble recognizing him. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, l- long hair, probably a <laughs> bit of gold stuck in his lip. Yeah. Brown tan skin. Mm, yeah. Uh, and also, they wore these little penis sheets, <laughs> yeah, you know, upright little cones. I think the bollocks were exposed. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's a bit like the um, like the Landsknecht, you know. They had the padding. Oh, you mean the the codpiece? Yeah, the codpiece. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. This was <laughs> this was another version, you know, but uh, made of precious metal. Yeah. Often. Mm. No, I mean it's uh, the research was definitely quite uh, quite impressive. What, what awaits us next in the trilogy then? Well, it was supposed to be then the final. I didn't even have a name for the final book, but it was going mm. to be the final voyage down the coast where they pick up the load of fake silver and the and a map, a Spanish map. Of course, they, they didn't take the silver. They thought it was <laughs> lead. And so they lost like they could have been absolutely set up for life yeah. with this. And they, they they just let it sink to the bottom of the ocean. Um, but the, the maps saved their lives in the end. Yeah. Um, until the Danes got hold of Sharp. It was going to be it was going to be Tom. Tom is still the hero, hmm. and I was going to turn him into a kind of figure of dread on St Thomas because I got the idea that he would become a kind of professional slave hunter for the Danes. Hmm. He, was, he was a sharpshooter, right? Yeah. Yeah. He had this wonderful rifle. So they would have been, because a lot of the slaves who were running away from the Danes on St. Thomas used to run for the cliffs and jump in, jump off the cliffs rather than be slaves. Mm. They'd run off the plantation, make for the cliffs and try and commit suicide. So in order to deter them, Tom would be employed to kind of shoot them before they got there. You know? <laughs> mm. But then kind of, there's a kind of, then I invented a disease, which uh, a famous British actor suffered from as well when I, uh, um, 
where your skin goes black. It's a kind of skin cancer. Mm. And he gets skin cancer in the face. So his face gradually turns black mm. while he's being this demonic slave shooter. And in his sort of mind, adult mind, he imagines he's doing them a favor. He imagines he's sending them to a better place mm. than the plantation, you see. Mm. And so, and also the Trinity is right in front of him because the Trinity was in harbor there. And one night it burned. Oh. It was burned down. Huh. So, so his end would be like, watching the ship burn and dying on the beach with a black face yeah? oh wow that sounds uh, that does sound like a very good ending skin cancer face yeah having <laughs> just killed sharp in the in the danish dungeon mm. as for some reason uh, due to the trial in london and everything sharp kind of takes treasure and absconds leaving tom penniless in London and he swears revenge. That's another mm. kind of invented thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, but that would have been the finale would have been the, the Trinity burning this guy with a black face lying in the, in, in the, in the surf and sharp dead in his dungeon. That would have been a, a nice goodbye, <laughs> mm. but did not, I never got there. You know, do you think, do you think you're ever going to put it to paper? Only if I get serious encouragement. Mm. You know, if somebody turns around and says, oh, yeah, we're going to publish the next book, then obviously, because artists live not just on money, you know, many of them don't ever have any, yeah. but also on encouragement, funnily enough. A couple of words of encouragement or some support mm. will often make, give an artist a new lease of life or something. I mean, at the moment, I'm just keeping myself busy with the Bible stuff, yeah. you know. I'm not fanatical about it, but it doesn't, it works. Art for me is a necessity of life. I, if I don't do it, if I don't either write or draw, something's missing, I feel unhappy. And when I've done it, I feel the day has been well lived. Mm. And if you go through life thinking your day has been badly lived, you can have a miserable life and probably die young. So the art is valuable for that for me, not not if it's good, commercial or whatever, yeah? Mm. But um, if it, if I get any encouragement, obviously, then it becomes a different story. Then you start getting illusions about, wow, I could be famous, <laughs> all, that, all that rubbish. Mm. And that can push you quite a long way, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. I think my mistake was that I was trying to write a historical book, but I was under the... The fiction, the, the, the novel writing skill wasn't really enough to make it like the, the glorious ones, like, you know, the mm. Count of Monte Cristo or something like that. Mm. It was never going to be a wonderful classic. But um, I think I sort of fell between two stools, if you know what I mean. Um, no, I'm not sure, actually. That's when you try to sit on two chairs at once and you fall on oh, the yeah. floor. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely like, uh, it's definitely an, amb an ambitious start. Mm, yeah, and also the thing took on a life of its own. You know, I thought it was going to be one small book and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, yeah. Kind of Frikey, you know, what do we got here? Yeah. I don't think my editing skills and my, I wasn't sharp enough, I wasn't sharp enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just had to go there. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, are there are there any sort of other pirates or events in history that you'd like to write about? At the moment, it's almost like I don't want to see another pirate in my life, you know? Oh, <laughs> uh, well. Because, because I put a lot of effort into it and the damn thing, the second book didn't get published. So I kind of, mm. at the moment, I'm looking much more at the, I don't know whether it's something to do with when you're getting older, but you look at relatives and wonder what sort of lives they had. Hmm. And going back and... Also, I'm increasingly, again, anger is always a big spur with me. And one of the main thing, one of the big things in these awful boarding schools and in, among this elite who run Britain is the fetishization of the First World War with the Poppy Day and all that remembrance day. It's a very big deal in this country. It's almost a test of patriotism, yeah? Okay. Uh, to the extent that if you're a television announcer and you don't have a poppy in your buttonhole on that day, you can get fired. You know, it's the so it's almost a fascist kind of thing because one of the first things Hitler did, the first law he passed when he came to power, was he made it an imprisonable offense to insult a veteran of the German army. Mm. 
So if you say anything against all this, you're kind of attacking something sacred in England, a veteran. Now, I know that soldiers are not saints, that being oh, no. a veteran doesn't automatically make you some sort of hero. Mm. But it's compulsory to think like that among a large section of the British public. Mm. And the right wing emphasizing that the whole time, the amount of products and little souvenirs and stuff that go along with it that they try to sell online. That just got me angry. So I said, well, I'm going to have a look at my own family history in the First World War and see how that fits in and imagine myself in these battles. Mm. My grandfather was in the German army. <laughs> oh, wow. Where, where, was, uh, where is he from? Or he's, was? From, he's from Bochum. He was captured, wounded and captured at Tannenberg fighting the Russians. Oh, wow. So he was then taken to work on the Murmansk Arctic Railway, mm. forced, forced labor. Oh, yeah. Transferred. The Germans were then transferred to Siberia because they were regarded as troublemakers, potential mm. troublemakers. Yeah. So he ended up in, in Barnaul in, in central Siberia. Mm. Wow. And uh, then the Russian Revolution came along. He couldn't, they couldn't really get the, the, the men back until 1921. Mm. Meanwhile, he lived in a nearby village and married a Russian woman. Oh. So that kind of history interests me. Yeah, that, whereas, was, uh, that was unexpected. <laughs> whereas buying poppies and commemorating so-called heroes, mm. it doesn't interest me, it irritates me. Mm. <laughs> so that kind of led me into looking at the First World War and also the fact that this paedophile naval commander at the boarding school was a kind of First World War hero. Mm. Yeah. So I'm I'm kind of drawing these strands together and it's I think a lot of a lot of um writers maybe are triggered by some anger from their past. Mm. I am, I know that. Mm. I I mean sometimes I don't get out of bed if I'm not angry. And it's quite easy to get angry in this country when you have the radio on in the morning. And you listen to the conservatives or something. Mm. <laughs> I just shoot out of bed. For the, I want to <laughs> like, hit somebody. <laughs> and I, I think it's probably the same in America with, with years of Trump. You know, everybody just listen to the news and you're you're furious. <laughs> mm. What the hell? You got to get you got to get the stuff out of your system. Yeah, I'm lucky because people who internalize it, and that's why I don't trust people who don't complain and strong, silent people and all that. In my experience, they tend to get cancer because it goes in. It doesn't mm. come out. Whereas I tend to get dandruff and write books. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's <laughs> it's better than cancer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you get, you know, you externalize. Mm. Oh, wow. And the, the, of course, there's a danger with that of projection. You project yeah. your own miseries onto everybody you meet. That, you've got to be aware of that. Mm. So long as you understand the dynamics, you have a bearable life. Yeah, I mean, no, there. I, in, in my experience, from what I've seen, a lot of uh, authors, especially the one that write really the gruesome stuff, they they always seem very calm and very uh, very thoughtful. Yeah, and they got, it, they got it out of their system. Exactly, and there's yeah. these like um, there's these like heavy metal artists who write songs about you know um, I come blood and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they yeah. just write about the worst stuff ever, but you know they're, they're nice people because they get it out. You know, as you as you said. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's these uh, suppressed ones, you know, the, <laughs> the tough guys, <laughs> hmm. the quiet one in the corner. Yeah, the, uh, the constipated ones. Yeah, yeah, but then they, they can suddenly erupt and then you've got trouble, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, um, uh, we've been going on for a while, uh, gone through a lot, so I think we can do some I fun hope, questions to conclude. I hope you've got enough to edit into something something interesting to listen to anyway. oh yeah yeah it's it's gonna be great that's for sure but i'm probably gonna like move around them a bit to sort of uh, structurize okay. them but yeah, yeah let's uh, let's do some uh, fun questions to as a oh, conclusion okay. okay okay so is there any sort of conception about pirates or misconception that uh, annoys you in particular i think there was a time when they were kind of romanticized and that annoys me and i don't like the childish disney transformation supernatural people turning into 
jellyfish or whatever. You know? <laughs> all, all that stuff just bores the pants off me. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm much, much more interested. That's why I quite like your um, YouTube channel because oh. you're dealing with um, respectable history, you know, mm. and then that is much more interesting than crazy fiction about, you know. But of course, I, I'm really going to recommend people to check out uh, The Hungry Horizon as well. Yeah. And also, if you come across a, a eccentric editor or publisher, the the Unholy Trinity is looking for a home. It, it can come out as a book on its own. Oh, yeah. In fact, I can, I mean, I don't mind sending you a, a, a PDF of the whole damn No, thing. I'd, I'd love to read it. Um, I um... Like I said, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that I didn't make my fortune writing about pirates, but at mm. least I got a little bit of interest here and there. Oh yeah, well, well, I'd, lo I'd love to read it because I'm, you know, yeah. I, yeah. Um, but yeah, next question: um, What is your favorite uh, pirate ship? Uh, so, uh, ship type that is. Ah, well, it would be the, something like the Unholy Trinity, something like the Trinity, which would be a small galleon, mm. a small Spanish galleon, circa sixteen seventy something. Mm. That, you know, we made in Guayaquil, <laughs> which was the main, um, what do you call it, where they make ships, the main shipyard, you know, mm, for the yeah. Pacific fleet. Apparently, the, the Santissima Trinidad was the name of the ship. Yeah. And it lasted for a long time, and it was a beautiful little thing. And it had lots of intricate carvings and stuff on it, which mm. were removed by the pirates, of course, yeah. because they chopped it down to the waterline almost to make it faster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, final question. Uh, who is your favorite pirate aside from Bartholomew Sharp? These guys are pretty nebulous characters at best of times. But one that has always fascinated me from a distance was <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence de Graaf. Oh, yeah. Apparently he was a holy terror and he was attacking mainly Yucatan. And I like him because there's a kind of musical connection to him because he he had a full orchestra playing in the back of his bloody, you know, ship oh <laughs> not just a couple of drums and bagpipes he had he had the like cellos violins you name it so wow it, you know you can imagine the soundtrack must have been good <laughs> also there is a famous song which comes directly from one of his raids called la bamba hmm. um, because when he attacked veracruz some of the townspeople took refuge in the cathedral and he set fire to the cathedral and Ooh. some of them tried to escape up the ladder into the bell tower, Ooh. but they all burned alive. So when, when they say in the song, para irse al cielo, to go to heaven, um, yariba, yariba, yariba ire, that means I'm going up this ladder to get to heaven while, and baila la bamba is basically all about burning to death in a cathedral you know that, that's wow. why it's Jonas and then you get bits of the, the nautical stuff you know soy marinero soy capitan and all that um so that little bit of stuff him and his orchestra and then that crazy song mm. <laughs> Lawrence de Graf, known as Lorenzio yeah or El Grifo yeah no he's uh, he's a great pick um I, I know some about him but uh, I definitely want to research him more in depth oh um, uh, yeah he would he would be um he would be much more of a kind of superhero than Shaw. <laughs> but I don't I don't read Dutch nor Flemish. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. So, so Yeah, it's it's a hard language to get into. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, well this uh this has been super fun. It's been very enlightening. Um just hearing all of your experiences, you know, it's you know, mm. uh picking up the lead pipes and uh see seeing all those beaches, you know, it's great great stuff, you know, a lot of yeah. a lot of exciting memories maybe not good memories but you know no i mean it's it's everybody's life is full of little incidents you know? yeah, yeah of course uh i'll uh, i'll catch you later we uh, we can chat some more in email probably okay yeah uh, and if you want any 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 information I, i'll mail it to you yeah yeah thank you well okay. uh yeah have a good one yeah you too uh, bye bye and that was the interview with mike hawthorne pirate history is hardly a comfortable topic as you might have realized as a long-term fan of this channel. However, it is far too often sugar-coated and almost fetishized in media. Books like The Hungry Horizon help us paint a more grim and honest picture of what pirate life actually was, the depraved lives that pirates lived, and the misery they put people through. 
Thanks to Mike's own experiences, he was really able to bring this period and cultures to life. Whilst heavily researched, the book contains some inaccuracies. Sailors never wore boots, and buccaneers used flintlocks, not matchlocks. But I guess that's minor details in the long run. I definitely think Mike needs all the support he can get. So please, click the Amazon link, buy his book, read it, and follow him on social media. Who knows, maybe we can help him get the Unholy Trinity published. Since Mike sent me the draft, I've gotten through about a fourth of it, and I agree with him that it's better than the first. I'd love to see it published. Anyway, thank you for watching the interview. Cheers.